us. All right. Uh, awesome. Uh, okay, well, welcome. Without further ado, uh, this is Jeroen from OpenEO, and uh, he's going to be talking about some cool stuff. <laughs> yep. Hi, thanks for coming. Uh, so OpenEO, quick recap of uh, what it is um, and, and why we started the project. It's an H2020 project funded by European Union. Um, and it started when, of course, due to the par paradigm shift that we had an earth observation of processing moving towards the data and moving towards cloud. You see multiple organizations starting to build processing platforms on their respective clouds. Uh, and of course, that ends up uh, with a bit of a problem because users are isolated uh, in the platform that they use, but there's, they cannot easily switch platforms. It's harder to reproduce work, etc. It's a fairly well-known problem. Uh, and also the solution is fairly well-known. That is, of course, to build a standard. Um, so that's the core of OpenEO. It's an API specification. But when we conceived the project, we immediately said like, okay, no, we don't want just the API. It's very important that we, from the start, uh, start building backend software, uh, multiple backend implementations actually, uh, and also multiple client implementations. So because that's what you need to get a, a standard that actually works. Uh, you can only verify it by implementing it. Uh, and so when we talk about OpenEO, it's also that part uh, that we think is very important. Um, another important part is, of course, the open part. Uh, we conceived it as a, uh, basically an open source project. Uh, so the community was very important to us and also the aspect of community building. Um, therefore, one example of that is that also the API itself uh, is developed uh, in GitHub as a project there in the open source way, uh, and it's based on open API specification. So while normally when you think of a standard, it's lots of documents, uh, we tried, well, it's still documented, of course, that's important, uh, but we tried to make it easier for users. So from the open API specification, uh, we generate the nice documentation with examples, um, we try to explain it very well. And also, a very important part of the OpenEO specification is actually the processes itself. So whereas, uh, for instance, in WPS, uh, you, have, you know how to invoke a process and how to define it, but they don't define the processes. Uh, and an integral part of OpenEO is actually the processes themselves. Uh, so you see them here, we, we have a whole list of them, uh, and they're also in the, the repository. Uh, another aspect that we took into account is, of course, data cubes. Um, everybody knows they're, they're quite convenient. Uh, for us, it means that you're not dealing with files anymore. You don't have to open files and write files. Uh, you get pixels being aligned automatically when, for instance, doing multi-sensor data fusion. Uh, and, of course, scalability is also important. That is, of course, not a, a property of a standard, uh, but more of a backend implementation. Uh, but at least the standard tries not to get in the way of scalability. So that's enough for the maybe more boring stuff. Uh, so let's try to show uh, what it actually looks like um, at this stage. Uh, so I built a demo in, in my Jupyter lab. That's where I usually do um, my uh, small code experiments. Uh, the demo is also available online. Um, and in this demo, it's about yeah, trying to process some Sentinel-2 data for an agriculture use case, uh, and mostly about the pre-processing part, because the other stuff simply isn't finished yet. Um, in, in the demo, I will be using the backend that we host at Vito. Wait, I have to see how to scroll down here. Good. Uh, and the first thing you do when, yeah, 
First, you need to, to have a backend URL. OpenEO is a web service, so you need to paste URL. Uh, you specify the web service. Uh, then you can list collections if you want. Uh, and a collection is like a Google Earth Engine image collection or a, a layer. Uh, and you find the ID uh, and you connect to it. Um, it's lazy, so I just did that, but nothing really important happened uh, because we are still specifying what we data we want to access and so on. And the next thing I want to do in the, the demo is uh, I want to use a, a nice vegetation index called the Enhanced Vegetation Index, which has still a relatively simple mathematical formula. Uh, and the Python client of OpenEO allows me to use mathematical operators to express that. So we were a bit inspired by tools like NumPy and Pandas to really make the, the client-side code look very elegant uh, and, and normal to researchers that, that like to work like this. Um, when we run this uh, cell, in fact, um, we don't really do any processing yet. This is, again, what's happening in the background. Uh, what OpenEO does for us is it constructs what we call a process graph. Uh, so, which is just a graph representation of our small workflow. Uh, and if we, we draw it like this, then yeah, you really see it that multiple elements are combined. And that's what makes it possible to send the same graph to multiple backends uh, that, that should uh, give the same result. So that's how it looks like internally. Uh, it's more complex than the client side code. So this is mostly for uh, the developers working on the OpenEO tools themselves. Um, okay, now I want to actually see my image. My, I have a nice download uh, method for that. Uh, I'm not going to be adventurous and run it live, given that the connection may not be so good here. Uh, and I get this image. Uh, at this point, there is a bit of a problem. Uh, you see that there are some white areas, that's clouds being removed, um, but there are still some cloud left at the edges. Uh, that's a well-known problem with Sentinel-2. Uh, if you use the Sentinel-2 scene classification, then you, you don't get, not all clouds are filtered out. So a very traditional step is then to use some cloud masking. Um, I have the scene classification layer available, and I also have these nice logical operators that I can apply to construct my mask. That gives me a simple binary mask, and now I'm going to do something more complicated, um, because if I use this, then still I will have cloud in my image. Uh, so I'm going to kind of like blur it out a bit uh, to extend the mask beyond uh, the pixels that are marked as cloud uh, into the pixels that are maybe clouds. Um, so it's a bit of fuzzy logic here, uh, and I'm going to use a, apply a, a caution using a 2D convolution opera operation. Uh, and in OpenEO, that's just called apply kernel, uh, and the, the kernel itself is constructed using SciPy. Um, so when we look at that result here, Here you see that uh, the, my raw images, the raw images on the right, uh, and in the middle you see that I now have some more cloud removed, and here is the fuzzy mask that I applied. Uh, so OpenEO allows me to retrieve that all in, uh, in real time. So I actually have the timings here in the notebook. Okay, so, so that's uh, on image level. Um, Actually, I can also, OpenEO also allows me to create a viewing service. That's quite nice. So you can say, hey, OpenEO, give me a WMTS so I can browse my map a bit. Um, that's not in the demo yet. Um, but I'm going to continue with looking at some time series. So now I'm going to look into time. Uh, and first, I will aggregate, uh, take the average pixel values inside a, a polygon that corresponds to a an agricultural field, uh, and plot that somewhere here. Uh, and I plot the data with my mask applied and without. Uh, and 
although my masked values are a bit better, they are, it's not yet smooth. Uh, so now I want to go for a more complex smoothing operation. Um, but I'm lazy, I don't like complex, so I'm going to use something that's already available in, uh, in SciPy, which is uh, an algorithm called the uh, Savitsky Goli filter. Um, now, thing is, well, no, first let's apply it on the time series. So the green line looks a bit smoother already, so I'm happy with that. Uh, but now I want to do that on the pixel level, but without actually having to re-implement it in terms of OpenEO predefined functions. Um, and for that, OpenEO has a very nice feature called user-defined functions, or UDFs, where you can simply uh, put, write a piece of Python code that can reuse libraries uh, and send that to the backend, which is then exec uh, run either on a single pixel or on a time series of pixel, depending on how you uh, specify or which function uh, you use. So I'm going to show the, the UDF. I load it from a file here. It's a bit of Python code. It, uh, the input is actually NumPy arrays. It can use pandas, uh, and it can use the, the SciPy Savitsky Goliath filter. Uh, and I have this nice apply dimension method available in OpenEO that I'm going to apply, uh, run on my data cube and then extract the time series. Uh, and then we, can, we get this result. Uh, maybe I should have shown the, compared it with uh, applying it on the polygon, but actually it's, it's already again a bit better. And the nice thing is that if I now download uh, an image, ah no, that's gone. <laughs> Normally here there should be an image but that's probably not going to happen anymore. Yeah, time is short, so let's not wait uh, for that. Um, good, back to the presentation. Uh, so those were already a few important features, uh, capabilities of OpenEO, uh, but there's more that's already implemented or uh, planned to be implemented. An important one is batch processing. Uh, all of the operations I showed was uh, happening on the fly because they were small, working on smaller bits of data. Um, although the backend that I used is uh, using Chill Trellis and Spark, so it's scalable, it can process more. Uh, but of course, a web request can time out. Uh, so if you have requests going on that will take multiple minutes, then you can do patch processing. And there we are looking at, for instance, retrieving time series for 10,000 of fields um, by running a patch process. Uh, machine learning is, of course, something very important. Um, another nice one is that we are connecting with Sentinel Hub. Those guys have done a, a ton of work in integrating numerous uh, Earth observation data layers, uh, and we don't want to redo that, so we just uh, integrated it into the backend so that we can offer layers that will fetch the data from there. Uh, and another one is, of course, uh, integrating more higher level algorithms than the ones you have seen here. So maybe doing image uh, segmentation, uh, a lot of machine learning algorithms uh, are in that category, or uh, maybe atmospheric correction, typical Earth observation things. Um, to wrap up, uh, there's also some other nice tooling being developed. One is the hub that lists all of the available backends. Um, and the nice thing about these backends is that a lot of them are really built on open source components. Uh, for instance, the URAC WCPS backend is built on Resaman. We have Mundialis uh, running on their Actinia platform uh, that uses Cross internally. Uh, and yeah, ours is built uh, on top of the Geo Trellis library, uh, which is also on a location tech project. Um, and we aggregate all of them into the hub to make it easy for users to, to find. Um, then there's the editor uh, of OpenEO. That's also a nice tool. Oh, no, back. Uh, yeah. 
There, people can have a, an online workspace where they can also construct these process graphs uh, here using the, yeah, the boxes. It's clearer over there. Uh, and then they can create, for instance, a web service out of that and browse uh, a map. This one is uh, using the, the Google Earth engine. So we also e expose some of the functionality that's in Google Earth engine, uh, but through the open interface. Okay, uh, yep, back to the slideshow. And that's it. <laughs> uh, thank you. Any questions? I don't see the audience so well. Yeah, so. Okay. All right, uh, down here in front. We'll repeat the questions. Yeah. Uh, is there any way to run this computation on the GPU? OK, so the question was. Yeah, the, the question was if there is any way to run the computations on uh, the GPU. Um, currently, there is no backend that does that, to my knowledge. Uh, but the nice thing is, of course, that we can Yeah, indeed, and, and also machine learning, for instance. Uh, so that's what we are looking at, at at Vito and are very interested in. So we already have uh, some Spark, custom Spark algorithms that use GPU, uh, but exposing that through the, the OpenEO interface, maybe even in a very transparent, transparent manner, uh, would really be nice uh, to have, yeah. Hi. Um, just a question. Uh, are these um, uh, applications already deployed to the VMs infrastructures? Yep, that's uh, another one. Uh, actually, not already at the moment, but we hope to have it in, in two weeks or so. <laughs> uh, so we've been working on it for uh, some months. Uh, and actually, that's also the, uh, the Vito backend that we are uh, deploying there. Uh, so some backends are more tied to a specific data center than others uh, because they already have a lot of infrastructure in there. But we are also uh, looking uh, at deploying it on Dias. So it should hopefully not take too long uh, anymore. Yeah, so the question was uh, that we indeed expose uh, Google Earth Engine layers and how we integrate. Uh, so the nice thing is actually that uh, Google is uh, part of the project, uh, although they are not funded, but they are a partner. Um, so they were so nice to help us out a little bit uh, by basically answering our questions. So the, the Google Earth Engine backend is built by uh, Munster University. Uh, and they were, I mean, Google was helping them out, telling them how to best interface. Uh, but basically, they're translating to the, the Earth Engine web API, I believe. Uh, and that backend is also available open source. So I think you can even look it up. Uh -huh. Thank you again, Jeroen. Thank you. <laughs> 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 <laughs>